Hey there, and welcome back to A Conspiracy of Gods, a custom 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons campaign written and produced by me, DeRay. I'm your DM. In this episode, we'll be discussing the exploits of our players prior to the point at which you meet them. Uh, they've done some things, met some people, killed some people, and... This is their background, essentially. This is what's been happening with them before you meet them in the tunnels outside Hathdorian. So, let's begin. The group, made up in the beginning of Fitzwilliam, Serathiel, and a halfling monk named Milo, gathered together in the south of Elios in an attempt to make some money and get over their pasts, and perhaps find some answers to questions. They meet up in the south of Elios after hearing about a legate in the town of Last Havens that was searching for outside assistance in a private matter. After meeting up, the three agreed to travel together, and made their way to Last Havens, a small town in southern Ilios. Upon reaching the town, the group moved through to the Legate's Manor, and inquired what precisely the Legate had in mind when he had advertised or asked after a group of adventurers. As it turns out, the Legate, Thaddeus, had had his daughter, Suliana, kidnapped by goblins. And by had-had, I really mean that the goblins had organized an ambush to take the daughter captive. The group agreed to rescue the daughter for the legate and kill off the goblins holding her captive, and went about finding more information about Suliana. In so doing, they met up with the local blacksmith and discovered that the man was more than a little enamored with Suliana, though hadn't expressed those feelings to the legate or Suliana herself. Afterward, the group headed out of town and discovered the goblin cave and began clearing out the fiends from within, meeting... An unexpected level of resistance. The goblins were more organized than they had come to know goblins to be. However, eventually they found the leader of the goblins, a, a goblin himself named Mork the Orc Crusher, better known to the party as Dork the Orc Crusher due to Fitzwilliam's vicious mockery. Mork, while fighting the group, became enraged after he lost his axe and was insulted by Fitzwilliam. In that rage, he attacked the group viciously with his own claws, his own hands. And as he did so, the group felt something pass into them uh, during the attack. However, the group persevered, and Mork fell beneath their blades and bows and sticks, I believe Milo fought with a quarter staff. After searching Mork's body, they discovered a small, abnormally cold pendant around his neck, which was engraved with the image of a snake with a baby's head within its mouth. Uh, what they what that represented, what that was, they had no idea, but they took it with them. Uh, the group then finished clearing the cave system and rescued Suliana from her captors and returned her to Last Havens, collecting the blacksmith in the meantime to carry her unconscious body, because it turns out two halflings and an elf have a bit of a problem carrying an unconscious human with them. On their way back to the town, however... The group passed a contingent of legionnaires that were attempting to fight a man wearing sable robes and carrying a large black staff. Uh, during that encounter, the group saw the man in robes cause 
large rocky spikes to to erupt from the ground, killing several legionnaires, before the man winked at the group and disappeared. Who who he was or what he was doing there, the group had no idea. However, uh, upon their return to Last Havens and collecting the blacksmith, the group reported into the legate, who rewarded them with gold, uh, some writs for some legion bred uh, and raised horses, as well as a letter of introduction to the legate of Ebolis, a small town further north in Elios. So the group left after having a strange encounter with a man that ran a magical emporium and headed toward Ebolis. However, during their travel, they found a stag standing just outside their campfire one night. And as the three of them watched, each of them had to combat something within them. Something they didn't understand and that was wholly foreign to them. Uh, fortunately for Fitzwilliam and Serathiel, they managed to resist the call of the stag's blood. However, Milo did not. Falling prey to this foreign presence within her body, Milo struck out at the stag viciously and killed it with her bare hands, tearing out its throat and bathing those same hands in its blood. And in so doing, she felt this foreign presence in her body calm, satisfied by the action. And the group grew very frightened of whatever had happened to them, and assumed that it had been Mark's doing. Though what it was, they still did not understand. Uh, however, they managed to make it to Ebolus without further incident where they discovered a local priest named Riva uh, and asked after whatever was going on with them, explaining the situation to him. Uh, Riva then provided them with a little a bit of information. It seemed to him that the group had been infected by spirit from the plane of elemental rage, a, a universal plane made outside the realms of mortals, outside something that they could possibly understand, but from whence several plains gods and the true god Altasoth came, though Altasoth is from a border region, as Riva explained to them. Um, however, Riva also offered to cure them of this infection, uh, for it was no mere curse nor disease, uh, but something else entirely. He offered to cure them if they would bring him all of the blood from an adult body, as well as a living innocent for each of them. Um, however, after Fitzwilliam failed to steal a baby in Ebolis, the group decided that they would deal with the situation at some later point, hoping that they might find additional information. Uh, they then left the temple and headed towards the Legate's Manor in Ebolis, where they had a discussion with the Legate, a rather heated discussion for Fitzwilliam had some difficulty uh, in keeping his mouth shut, believing that the Legate had been rude to him. However, they managed to successfully navigate these treacherous political waters, and discovered that four people in Ebolus had been murdered, and that the legion in the city, in the town, rather, were stretched thin, and were not currently well able to handle the situation. Thus, the legate's unwilling acceptance of outside assistance. Uh, particularly with the recommendation of his friend and colleague, uh, Legate Thaddeus of Last Havens. So, uh, the, the Legate of Ebolus ended up sending the group to speak with his sergeant, a woman in command of the investigation here in Ebolus, uh, at which point 
During the investigation of the dead bodies, Fitzwilliam struck up something of a romance uh, with this sergeant, though never actually asked for her name. The group then, after learning all they could from the bodies, headed to the local tavern, hoping to find more information about the victims and about anything else that was going on in town. There, they met a group of soldiers or bounty hunters or something of the like, they weren't certain, uh, from Western Cantor, who actually gladly informed the group after learning of their efforts that this was not the first town to experience identical murders like these. In fact, there had been a series of towns and cities beginning near the Palon Wall and heading east, all of which had five identical murders within them. Realizing that this was far more than a few serial murders in Ebolus, the group left to inform the sergeant of the new information and to suggest some actions a watch on the city for the murderer and such. While doing so, Fitzwilliam actually managed to make a date with the sergeant uh, for two nights from the end of the investigation. They would get dinner. It would be a, quite a nice evening, or so they planned. Uh, after informing the sergeant and spending some time, spending several hours with the Legion setting up patrols, checking for tunnel systems and things of that nature, uh, the group headed to the temple because Fitzwilliam had remembered reading something or seeing something about a ritual of stabilization that might involve some of the body parts that were missing from the victims. However, he couldn't remember the details, and so the group decided that perhaps this priest Riva, well-versed as he was in strange magics at the very least, might have additional information. However, uh, as the group reached the temple and saw that it was most likely empty, they also saw who they assumed was the murderer. A, a for the woman was being chased down the street by the legion, running toward the temple. Unfortunately for them, they also began hearing what sounded distinctly like an incantation coming from within the temple. Uh, they were able to recognize some of the language, bits and pieces of it as Thanish, and other bits and pieces as Dwarfish, but none of them were actually familiar with the actual language. However, they were very distracted very soon after that, as the murderer bowled through them into the temple, and a few seconds later, the entire temple exploded violently, throwing them in a wave of energy um, into the street outside the temple and completely collapsing the structure. Afterward, despite several investigations, no one was able to find any bodies within, and Riva, the priest, as well as the murderer, are both presumed dead. Afterward, the group, you know, headed to the legate to report in on the happenings and suggest that they believed that there was more going on than met the eye and would like to continue their investigation, for which they gained permission from the legate to do as they saw fit, despite having already been paid. And they decided to continue their investigation in the morning. However, as they slept in the tavern that night, Fitzwilliam awoke to see a shadowy figure placing something at the end of his bed. Soon after, the entire group found themselves in some sort of earthen sphere that seemed to be maintained by a man in sable robes with a large black staff. Uh, that same man informed them that there was no natural magic that had caused what had happened. Uh, while none of them really understood to what he was referring, uh, this is all the information he provided before the sphere disappeared, and the group found themselves 
standing atop turned and broken earth in what was once Ebolus. As they looked around, they realized that there was nothing left, nothing man-made, nothing to mark this as a spot upon which a town once stood. All that was left was shattered and broken earth, as well as a very obvious magical residue. It was also at that time that the group met a dwarven cleric of Thor, the god champion of Militia, whose name was Kelsifer. Uh, this dwarf had managed to save their horses as they fled from Ibelis, um, and approached warily, unsure of what had become of the town and the people standing in. However, the group explained themselves and revealed their desire to hunt down information regarding the language they had heard. Kelsifer offered some suggestions with the condition that he join them in their quest, to which they agreed, and at Kelsifer's suggestion, he led them towards the dwarven surface city of Sadra Hill a center of trade and commerce for the Tanar Dwarves. Once there, the group met an alchemist who provided them with some potions that he claimed would help control their bloodlust, as well as an arcanist who essentially confirmed what Riva had told them without adding any new information. The group also met with the owner of a candy shop named McSweetens, who had a strange fascination with Serathiel, and provided all of them, largely for free, some delicious and nourishing candy. On their way through Cedra Hill towards the Hall of the Lord of the City, the group was intercepted by some shady-looking thugs who invited them, so to speak, to a tavern named Raven Skull in the Lower Ward. The group accepted the invitation, uh, and inside Raven Skull, they met up with an old contact of Fitzwilliams, a gnomish woman named Nightshade, who offered to procure them illicit materials, things like poisons and babies, should they request it as well as to work with them in whatever outposts they visit that she has contacts and people in. The group returned from Raven Skull and made their way to the Hall of the Lord of the City and met, eventually, with Maldorak the Uncrowned, kin of Ungarath Ironbound, son of Prathdorin the Unhinged, brother of the Forge Summoner, Lord of the Lake Under the Mountain, of the clan Gathonor, the Kingslayers, uh, the Lord of the uh, City of Sadra Hill. Uh, once there, Lord Maldorak explained to the group that some strange form of construct had been attacking the city, and that they were being contracted to find and destroy the source of the constructs. The group left their city, rather they left Sadra Hill, and ended up in some ancient dwarven tunnels. And after fighting through several vaguely robotic constructs, they discovered an ancient tome that they suspected dated back to the First Thanish Empire, uh, which they did end up taking with them. Uh, in addition, they found a very fuzzy stuffed penguin um, that seemed to have some sort of magically imbued sedative or, or control magic upon it, for it assisted them in the controlling of their emotions, including their bloodlust. They also discovered a very innocent construct by the name of Helperbot, who was later renamed by the group Hugbot after the group proceeded to fix the travesty that was Helperbot never having experienced a hug. Helperbot 
Then, after understanding the true nature of a hug, thanks to Fitzwilliam and Serathiel, informs the group that his master, a, a wizard named Taranik, had once been very great and powerful and very wise. But after Taranik had lost his arm and replaced it with a constructed one, he began to become sullen and stop seeing Helpbot which was his first creation. The group proceeded forth and discovered Taranek, convincing him to speak with Helperbot, despite his obvious descent into madness. As he left to do so, the group discovered a small cube that emanated immense power, and they suspected was used in the creation of of the constructs that had been attacking Sadra Hill. As they inspected it, Calcifer realized that this cube appeared to contain a very small, very angry piece of a powerful god. Meanwhile, Taranik, while speaking with Helberbot, decided that it would be best to end his own life. The group was unable to stop him, from doing so, and upon discovering his body, made a thorough search of it, discovering a second, small, cold pendant identical to the first that they had found on Mork. Together with the things they had collected, as well as Helperbot, uh, the group decided to destroy the cube containing the peace of God using a creation of Terranix as assistance. However, destroying the cube released a great deal of energy, destabilizing the tunnel system and causing it to collapse. As the group escaped, with Helperbot in tow, they nearly lost Helperbot as a boulder came and crushed one of his arms. However, they did manage to escape with Helperbot minus an arm. The group returned then to Maldorok, who paid them and granted them passage to the dwarven ar archival city of Hathdorian, the only place that it seemed likely uh, they would discover anything about the language they were seeking. Uh, the group dropped Helperbot off with McSweeten in the hopes that the kindly man could assist Helperbot in getting over the trauma he had suffered. And then they headed toward Hathdorian, with the assistance of a very confused orc. Uh, once within the archival city, the group procured some writing supplies to copy tomes, for they could not leave their towers, uh, as well as paid a visit to the House of Translation, where they deposited the tome they had collected from the lair of Taranik, in the hope that it might have useful information for them at some later point. They then headed to the Tower of Arcana, one of eleven towers of Hathdorian, where Calcifer learned a new way to commune with Thor before he was kicked out of the tower for insulting the librarian, and Fitzwilliam learned of a bard of exceptional magical talent whose name was wiped out of history just after the fall of the Second Thanish Empire. Serathiel learned ways to make her combat magic non-lethal, allowing her, in good conscience, to lay the smack down from this point forward. Milo attempted to learn more about the god named the Mistress of Threads, a goddess she'd been having visions of during their travels. In this process, she discovered that the tome she was reading, a book on human mythology, had pages missing toward the end of it. After she informed the librarian, the entire group learned that there was a break-in some months ago, resulting in a missing tome and, apparently, this vandalism. The librarian and the group were quite suspicious because all of these tomes had been imbued with powerful magic to keep them from decaying or being destroyed. However, the librarian had no more answers for them, and in the end, Milo and Fitzwilliam decided that they would head back to the tavern where Calcifer had returned 
after being kicked out of the tower, while Serathio continued studying this form of non-lethal magic. Unfortunately for Fitzwilliam and Milo, there was a brawl going on in the tavern, and while normally not an issue, blood had been spilled during this brawl, causing both Fitzwilliam and Milo to lose control of their bloodlust, and essentially attack anyone they could see, hoping to gain whatever blood they could to soothe the rage inside of them. Calcifer, for his part, attempted to pacify both of them by hitting them really, really hard in the head and knocking them unconscious, which he actually managed to do, though he did, uh, in the end, have to mend a broken femur of Fitzwilliam's, courtesy of some dwarves that were none too pleased that Fitzwilliam was attempting to kill them. However, with the two of them unconscious, Calcifer brought them upstairs to a room so that they could rest. However, within the room, three hooded men that had been watching the group within the tavern entered, telling Calcifer that they could help Milo. Before Calcifer could do anything to stop them, the three men disappeared with Milo's physical body, leaving all of her possessions on the bed. It was at that point that Serathiel, having returned from the Tower of Arcana, arrived, as well as an interested half-orc named Zahn. While standing there having a bit of an argument with this stranger, Fitzwilliam woke up, courtesy of Zahn, who, ignoring the attempt at a heated discussion with Calcifer, woke him up using some form of potion. After Fitzwilliam learns what's happened with Milo, as well as the hooded figures, and Zahn explains that he is an alchemist that's seeking some adventure to pay for research, the group agree to let him join, and set out to continue their quest. They realize that they can't help Milo at this point, and so decide that their best course of action is continuing to attempt to learn about the language they had heard. However, they weren't totally certain where they could find information, so first the group visited the Tower of Rhetoric, where Fitzwilliam attempted to perform a bit of a song to gain the approval of those within the tower. However, in so doing, Fitzwilliam found himself having a vision of the bard he'd read about, gaining a second voice within his head in addition to the voice of the bloodlust, begging him to find someone named Telic Thriceblessed. However, apart from that small detour, the group eventually found their way to the Tower of Languages, uh, where they discover that the language they heard had been constructed by the gnomes during the First Thanish Empire, uh, and was used by the elite magic users of the Empire in all of their endeavors. The group learned that it was a language made specifically to work magic, but that it hadn't been spoken by anyone, Thanish or Dwarfish, since the fall of the First Empire. The group also, before leaving Hath Dorian, had made their way to the Tower of History, uh, hoping to gain additional information about the use of this language, about the magic users of the First Empire. However, before they could discover anything, they were met by a noble of House Reth, the house that the current king of the Tanar clans came from, as well as the overseer of the Tower of History, who offered the group a great deal of gold, as well as housing, if they would head east toward the lost Atlax cities to investigate what he believed was a conspiracy between a dwarven noble and the gnomes. The group, being enticed by the lucrative offer, accepted. 
and deciding that they could put their quest for information about the users of this magic language on hold, headed out of Hathdorian soon after. However, all was not well in their travels. They were awakened one night by a loud cracking, only to see that the troughs along the, law, uh, along the walls that were full of lava that were lighting and heating these tunnels for all of the travel they'd been doing had cracked and broken open, and were spilling lava into the tunnel that was moving toward them very quickly. The group, taking the obvious course of action, fled and found themselves eventually, after taking some unexpected turns, in a decrepit city full of people in chains. The group was accosted by guards of the city once they arrived and taken to the, to the lords of the city where they were offered an option. The group could discover the leaders of a fledgling rebellion within the city, or they would be free within the city, but incapable of leaving. The group also learned from these lords of the city that the chained people were not slaves, but were afflicted by a magical disease that was slowly killing them. And once those people were dead, it would cause them to release the magical energy violently. The chains upon them were meant to slow the progress, for they were magic nullification manacles. The lords of the city also informed the group that they were attempting desperately to discover a cure to this, this disease to help the people of this city. The group then set out to find the rebels rather reluctantly. They weren't certain if they could trust the lords of the city. Unfortunately, just after they had left the Tower of the Lords, they were ambushed by a Nothic and Shadows. Though why these creatures were within this city of slaves, they never learned. However, as they fought... One of the lords of the city they had just met, a dragonborn named Mithraus, assisted them, leaping from the tower to join the fray, and lending Fitzwilliam and Sorathiel some control of their bloodlust as they fell victim to it. How he did so, the group is not entirely certain. During combat, Zahn through a brand new potion, to which he had added an entire lava flower in their travels, in an attempt to defeat their enemies. This potion created a 40-foot-tall, 20-foot-wide pillar of lava, nearly setting Zahn on fire, as well as utterly incinerating the Nothic they had been fighting. As the pillar of lava died down, it hardened to a pillar of pure obsidian, which now stands just outside the Tower of the Lords of the City of Slaves. However, the group managed to survive, and after taking a long rest, headed out into the city to discover the rebels. As they traveled through the city, they were intercepted by... A shuddering of magic that seemed to shake the walls of reality around them, leading to the appearance of what they could only describe as a spirit or a specter, although it had the qualities of neither, truly. The group realized as this, as this thing stood before them that it bore a striking resemblance to Nalum Aurelian, the first king of Elios. Nalum gave each of the party members a message in a language only they knew uh, before disappearing entirely. What the first king said to Calcifer and Serathiel is unknown, but according to Zahn and Fitzwilliam, Zahn was told that his father was of royal blood, and Fitzwilliam was told that he would pay for his sins and the sins of those he cared about. 
Taking a moment to recover from this shock, the group then continued on their way, uh, finding the rebellion, the leader of the rebellion, a tiefling woman, within a cavern at the edge of the city. After a short bit of fighting, in which Serathiel caused unimaginable agony to a man using magic, and then watched as that man exploded before her very eyes from the magical contamination of his body, Fitzwilliam managed to talk the tiefling down long enough for one of the lords of the city to appear, presumably having followed the group. That lord, an elven woman, threw some form of aerosol potion or something of that nature into the cavern, which, as it exploded, seemed to assuage some of the pain that the afflicted were experiencing, enough so that they seemed to stand straighter and look more hopeful than they had before. Um, The elf then convinced the tiefling that the lords of the city uh, had made a breakthrough in their attempt to find a cure, as just demonstrated, and that the that a cure for this affliction was near. The tiefling, either in relief or exhaustion or in despair of the pain that she had thus far caused, slumped over then, dead, and the group fled down the cavern returning to the lords of the city, for they knew that the tiefling was about to explode in her death, which she very promptly did. But the group returned to the lords of the city and provided them some information and suggestions to prevent another rebellion from rising. Suggestions like attempting to find a way to make the manacles look less like manacles and to inform the afflicted people of the city that they were neither slaves nor beholden to the lords, that the lords were simply attempting to find a cure and to keep them from destroying each other and people they cared about. The lords of the city, particularly Mithraos, accepted these suggestions and this information, feeling that they had failed in what they had attempted to do, but would continue working toward a cure. The lords then paid the group, with three stones of transmutation for their efforts, and provided them a guide back to the main tunnel they had originally left. Once there, the group, as they prepared to be on their way, heard someone speaking with themselves, and as they listened to the conversation they were hearing, they were approached by the speaker, a fire giant who introduced himself as Seraphae. And that, dear listeners, is where we will begin with the first actual play episode of A Conspiracy of Gods. I realize this is a lot of information to take in, um, and if you have questions or want additional details, I will be posting some of this information on our website, aconspiracyofgods.weebly.com. As always, I hope you enjoyed listening to this history, this collection of activities that our players have been through, and I hope you will enjoy learning more about the world that we've created as our players continue forward. Until then, I'm DeRay, and as always, thank you for listening.